Before learning the conversations from this short story, we need to know about profiles of characters of this story. Number 1. Laura Smith. Detective Smith is a policewoman who works in London. After her previous experiences with Natalie and Alice, she now specializes in cases related to the world of art. Number 2. Peter Thompson. Peter is a detective and colleague of Detective Smith. He has had less time on the job and, therefore, Detective Smith is his guide and mentor. He listens attentively to what she says and follows her instructions to the letter, although he is not afraid to give his opinion when he thinks necessary. Number 3. Natalie. A young art historian and curator who works at the Tate Museum. Number 4. Emily Brown. The director of the Tate Museum. Number 5. Chief Inspector Turner. Chief Inspector at the police station where Detective Smith works. He controls the work of everyone in the division. Number 6. James. A scholar at the Tate Museum, under the supervision of Natalie. He is an art history student. Everyone in his family is on the police force but he wants to dedicate his life to painting. Next chapter. I'll talk about introduction to the story. See you next chapter. Introduction to the story. Shortly after arresting a major art forger, Detective Laura Smith receives a call from the director of the Tate Museum in London. Has another work of art gone missing? Actually, the opposite. A mysterious painting has appeared on the Tate walls. No one knows where it came from or how it got there. Detective Smith goes to the museum with her partner Peter Thompson. They meet the director, Emily, and the curator, Natalie. Could this be a mistake? A joke? In fact, it's neither. They discover some tiny writing on the back of the painting. This painting is not here by accident. While they try to figure out where the painting came from, they further discover that it is filled with clues. The painting contains five scenes, each representing a crime that will be committed somewhere in London by the end of the day. As they race around the city to stop this crime wave, more questions arise. Who is behind this network of organized crime? And who is trying to warn Detective Smith? This is end of the introduction to the story. See you next chapter. That is chapter 1. The Call. Chapter 1. The Call. Detective Smith wakes up to the sound of her telephone ringing. She looks at the clock and sees that it is 8 o'clock in the morning. She hears her son, Jake, answering the call. After a few minutes, she summons up the energy to get out of bed and go to the kitchen. Good morning, Mummy. Good morning, son. How are you today? Very well. How are you, Mummy? Very tired. I've been working a lot this week. I hope the next few days will be quieter. Me too. I'm exhausted. Really? Why is that, son? They have me working very hard at school. The teacher is making us paint, paint, and paint, and she wants us to use lots of colors. Then it's story time. Then we have to sing a song, and then play ball. I see. And then at home, your mother stays asleep and you have to answer the phone. Who was it, by the way? Your boss. He said it was agent. Agent? No, it wasn't agent. He said it was indigent. What do you mean, Jake? Wait, did he say it was urgent? Yes, he said it was urgent. Chapter 2. The Urgency Detective Smith grabs her mobile and calls her boss, Inspector Turner. He is a man with a bad temper who can be quite brusque, but they have always got along. While Laura is talking, she prepares a hot chocolate for Jake, which he drinks in silence while watching cartoons. Hello? Hi, Detective Turner. 
It's me, Detective Smith. You called a while ago? Yes, I told your son it was urgent. Where were you? Sorry, after last week's case I was really tired. I was in bed. Good. I hope you slept enough because we have something new that requires you to come down to the station immediately. Oh no. What's it about? Another forgery? I can't give you any more details over the phone. Detective Smith, you must come in. Take Jake to school and come immediately. Okay. I'll be there in half an hour. Perfect. We will wait for you. See you then. See you then. Mummy, what does urgent mean? Chapter 3. Something Unexpected After leaving Jake at school, Laura drives to the police station, where she works, as quickly as possible. On arriving, she sees that Detective Inspector Turner is waiting for her at the door and he looks worried. Detective Turner, what's happened? What is so urgent? I can't tell you here. Let's go into the office and I'll show you. What a mystery. It must be a very sensitive case. Is Peter inside? Yes, everyone's inside. It's a very serious matter. And needs your immediate attention. Surprise! surprise! Wow, what's all this? A surprise party for me? Happy birthday, Detective Smith. But my birthday is on the 12th of September. Today is the 12th of September, Smith. You're already 40 years old. Oh goodness, you're right. Thanks, partner. I'm beginning to think that you need a holiday. Everyone, let's make a toast for our best detective who, in case no one noticed, yesterday caught Jeremy Bates the biggest forger of Picasso in all of Europe. Cheers. 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 Thank you, everyone. It's an honor to work with this team. Hold on, is that cheesecake? Can I have some? Chapter 4. The Second Call While they are celebrating Laura's birthday at the police station, the phone rings in her office. Swallowing the last mouthful of her slice of cheesecake quickly, Detective Smith answers the phone. Hello, who is speaking? Detective Smith, it's Emily Brown the director of the Tate Museum. Congratulations. Good morning, Emily. Did you also find out it was my birthday? It seems I was the last person to know. I didn't realize it was your birthday. Happy birthday. I was congratulating you on catching Jeremy Bates. At last, we've stopped that wrongdoer. I don't know what makes me angrier. That his paintings were so good that they tricked our best specialists or that someone that talented decided to dedicate himself to forgeries rather than develop his own artistic career. I know. It's really a shame. What are you going to do with his paintings? Well, as they are not original Picassos, we can consider them historical pieces. Especially as the artist has been captured. We are planning a special exhibition dedicated to forgeries. I think that's a great idea. Ever since we worked together on the robbery of the William Turner drawings, I've become more and more interested in cases related to the world of art. I know. That's exactly why I called you. Oh no. Has there been a robbery at the museum? Actually no. The opposite. It would be better if you came. Chapter 5. The Appearance After making excuses to her boss and colleagues for not staying to eat and drink for a while longer, Laura heads to the Tate Museum. When she arrives, she meets Emily and her friend Natalie, who she worked with previously to catch an art thief. Emily and Natalie are looking worriedly at a large painting in one of the most important rooms in the contemporary art wing of the museum. Laura, how are you? Hi Natalie, fine. How are you? And Alice? Alice can hardly move. She's due to give birth in a few weeks and the baby is very restless. But apart from that, everything is fine. That's great. And how are you, Emily? Your phone call made me very curious. Are you going to tell me what has happened? 
Perhaps this painting has been forged? Or was it stolen? To be quite honest, we are not sure what is wrong with this painting. Chapter 6. The Missing File Detective Smith cannot work out why Emily and Natalie have called her. There seems to be a problem with the painting in front of them, but, so far, they haven't been able to tell her what. I think it's best if we tell you how we realized something was up. Okay. Over the last few weeks, lots of new paintings have arrived at the museum. I'm sure you've noticed that the works come with a small sign, a data sheet, which explains who the artist is, when the work was painted, and so on. Yes, of course. Well, today all of the files arrived for the new paintings. However, when we had finished putting them out, we noticed that this painting didn't have a file. We thought there was a mistake, but that's not the case. The file wasn't printed as this painting isn't part of our collection. What do you mean? This isn't our painting. We didn't buy it. Nobody donated it. It simply turned up here. Chapter 7. The Painting For the first time since her arrival, Laura stops to look at the work. It's a big painting, at least 2 meters wide and 1 meter tall with a thick metallic frame. There are various scenes with lots of people in the painting. It makes her think about the Where's Wally? books that Jake really loves. I understand. It's very mysterious. Suddenly there is a painting hanging here. I'm sure it's a mistake, but I understand your concern. We will need to go over the security cameras and speak with the employees of the museum. Of course, we haven't done that yet. We thought we would call you before doing anything because... Well, we were worried there could be something in the frame or behind the canvas. A strange device. You mean to say there could be a bomb in the picture? Chapter 8. The Bomb Emily has just told Detective Smith that they suspect there might be explosives in the picture that mysteriously appeared in the museum. Laura makes a telephone call. Who did you call? My colleague, Peter. He's on his way with our bomb detector. But before that, why do you think there could be a bomb in the picture? Well, of course, it's just an idea, but it occurred to us that many important people visit the museum. Politicians from around the world, members of the royal family, business people. It's the perfect way to bring in an explosive without setting off the security controls. Well thought. It's, of course, a possibility. Is there an important event coming up? Yes, of course. We have all sorts of events this month and lots of important personalities from around the world will be coming. Okay. Later, if possible, I'd like a detailed list. But look, here comes our bomb detector. How handsome he is. Chapter 9. The Bomb Detector Peter, Laura's colleague, approaches along the corridor. An enormous police dog is on a lead. Natalie, who loves dogs, approaches it and starts stroking it. How handsome you are, puppy. What's his name? Officially, he's called K9-1977. But we call him, X-Ray. Why X-Ray? Because he can see through things. Nothing gets past X-Ray. He's the best. You are so lovely, X-Ray. I'd love to take you home. Unfortunately, he is needed at the central office, but you can visit him whenever you like. Okay, okay, enough pampering. This is the painting I was talking about, Peter. Bring X-Ray over here and see if he can detect anything. Chapter 10. Safe. After X-Ray, the bomb detector dog, gets closer to the painting and doesn't have any reaction, Detective Smith and Peter assure Emily and Natalie that there are no explosives hidden behind the painting or in the frame. We are safe. If X-Ray doesn't smell anything, it's because there isn't anything to worry about. Well, nothing that can explode, at least. There could still be a letter, a message, 
or a clue from the person who brought the painting to the museum. Unless it was a simple mistake. I hope so. Now, if there's no problem, I would like to take the painting down and see if there is anything in the frame or behind the painting. Is that possible? Of course. I'll call my assistant. Chapter 11. James, the assistant. After Natalie calls James, her assistant, he joins them. He is a young man of about 25 years old, very smiley and happy. He is tall and has black curly hair. Natalie introduces James to Detective Smith and Peter. A pleasure to meet you, James. The pleasure's all mine. So, you're coppers? Yes, but don't be alarmed. We're just investigating. Oh, don't worry about that. I'm more than used to the police. How come? Well, because nearly everyone in my family is in the police force. My dad, my uncles, my older sisters. I'm the black sheep. Can you imagine my dad's reaction when I told him I wanted to study art? I can imagine. I come from a family of artists. Chapter 12. The Frame. Natalie notices that Detective Smith is getting impatient and, therefore, interrupts the two boys, who are chatting about their families, so that they can go back to concentrating on the task in front of them. James, could you help me lower this painting and turn it around so that the detectives can study it closer? Of course. Sorry. Let's see. It looks like there isn't anything behind the canvas. The back of the frame is hollow. We can do tests, but I don't see any suspicious object or substance. I'm starting to think that this picture is here by mistake. This picture is not here by mistake. What do you mean? How do you know? It says there. Look, in this corner. Something is written. This picture is not here by mistake. Chapter 13 this picture is not here by mistake. Everyone gets closer to have a look at the writing that Natalie pointed out, except James, who stays apart stroking the dog Tenth Ray. The text is small and written in red paint. Do you think this is a joke? That someone is laughing at the security of this museum? It could be a conceptual piece of art. A frustrated artist who wants to prove there is an exclusive group of artists. I don't think it's something that convoluted. Although it isn't as simple as we think either. What's certain is that the person who brought this picture to the museum is trying to tell us something. Well, we have to go over the security recordings to see if we can find out who it was. That's not necessary. I know who brought the picture to the museum. Who was it? Me, of course. Chapter 14. The Explanation. Everyone looks open-mouthed at James until Natalie works out what the boy wanted to say. Of course, James brings all of the pictures. How does that work? It works this way. When there is a donation, a sale, or another type of acquisition. The museum is in charge of going to get the pieces from the airport or wherever they need to be collected from. James is the one who goes to get them. Is he the only person in charge of the pieces until they get here? No, of course not. We have a special lorry and a complete team of specialists, but James is in charge of coordinating their movements and keeping me informed. Exactly. This painting arrived approximately a week ago, and I went to get it myself. Chapter 15. The Mysterious Call. After listening to Natalie and James's explanation, Detective Smith and Peter continue to inquire about the origin of the mysterious painting that has appeared on the wall of the Tate Museum. Where did you go to collect the picture? It wasn't out of the ordinary. I received a call with the order to collect the picture from an art warehouse that I have been to before. Many important galleries in the city use it. When I got there, the head of the warehouse showed me where the picture was and we put it in the lorry. There wasn't anyone else at the warehouse? No, only the picture. 
Wait a moment, James. I'm the only person who tells you where to go and get the new works of art. But I didn't send you to get this painting. Why did you pay attention to that call? Well because it was you. I remember it perfectly. It was a rainy day. You had gone out to accompany Alice for her scan. After a couple of hours, I received the call. I didn't recognize the number but, when I answered, it was you. I thought maybe you were calling me from Alice's phone. You also told me exactly where to hang the picture. James. I didn't make any call on that day. Chapter 16. The Unknown Number. On discovering that the mysterious call to pick up the picture wasn't made by Natalie, they asked James to find, on his phone, the number that called him on that date. Natalie, do you remember which day it was? Of course, Alice had her scan on Friday the 6th of September. I remember perfectly as we had the doctor's appointment arranged for months and it was written on a note on the fridge. Okay, let's see. Yes, I received just one call on that day from this number. Peter, please can you take down the number? Take X-ray back to the central office, then go to the police station and check with the telephone company who that number belongs to. Natalie, does the number seem familiar? Not at all. It's not Alice's number and, anyway, I'm sure I didn't make any calls on that day. Don't worry. We will soon find out who called James pretending to be you. Chapter 17. The picture leaves the museum. Peter leaves the museum, taking the dog with him. Then Laura explains to them that she will need to take the picture with her to the police station. I'm not sure whether it's a crime to take a work of art to a museum. But impersonating another person definitely is. Therefore, we can open up an investigation. I will have to take the painting with me as evidence. You are taking the picture? Yes, of course. We're going to have to take it to the police station. I was actually thinking you could help me transport it with the team and lorry that you mentioned before. Of course, detective. It's a shame. Why do you say that? Well, because it's surrounded by mystery. This picture is becoming more and more interesting. Believe me, the most interesting part will be when we find out who is behind this prank. Chapter 18. The Police Station. Detective Smith and James take the picture to the police station and put it in Detective Smith's office. While they are there, Peter knocks on the door. He has some news about the telephone number that was used to call James. I have good news and bad news. The good first, then I'll deal with the problems. Okay, the good news is that I found out quite a lot about the phone number. It belongs to Vodafone, one of the sims they sell in the shops. I know they normally ask for a document or passport number to sell them, but the company told me that there is no record of sale for this sim, so it must have been stolen. I thought so. What about the call log? Could they identify any call from this number? Yes, they identified two calls. One of the calls was made to Jake, and the other. That's the bad news. To whom was the second call made? A protected number. Chapter 19. Protected Numbers. Peter has just told Detective Smith everything he was able to find out about the telephone number that was used to call James to ask him to take the mysterious painting to the museum. After calling James, the phone was used to call a protected number. What's a protected number? It could belong to a politician, a member of the royal family, someone in the military, an MI5 operative. Protected numbers are for people who are very important. That's why the telephone companies can't give us that information. We could get the information if we ask for authorization from someone higher up, but they would never give it to us for a case like this. They only normally give this information when there's a kidnapping, a terrorist attack, something big. Okay, I didn't know that existed. Do the police have protected numbers? Yes, 
of course, in the higher ranks like Detective Inspector Turner. Chapter 20 Father and Son Detective Inspector Turner approaches Laura, Peter, and James with a worried expression. What's this? What's happened here? What are you talking about, sir? James, are you okay? Has something bad happened? Do you know each other? Know him? He's my son. Of course, don't you remember? I told you my dad was a policeman. There's no problem, dad. I'm here because of this picture. What's this picture? Did you paint it? Ha 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 ha. That would be the easy explanation. No. This picture appeared at the Tate Museum. Who would have thought? I studied art in order to not get involved in crimes and mysteries, and here I am at my father's police station, involved in an investigation. Chapter 21. The Warehouse. Detective Smith and Peter head to the warehouse that the picture had been collected from. It's a big shed with lots of small spaces in the storage facility. The owner of the warehouse, Mr. Bennett, meets them at the door. Mr. Bennett? Good day. I'm Detective Smith and this is Detective Thompson. Good day, detectives. As we said on the phone earlier. We have a few questions to ask you about a picture someone kept in this storage area, and which then was taken by an employee of the Tate Museum. Yes, of course, I remember. I have found the papers and the person in question only left a name and a surname. Let's see. He was called Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown? Is that all? Well, yes. There wasn't a document number? Contact details? An address? A telephone number? Not that I can see. Generally, we don't ask too much information when they pay in advance. Also, the boy told me that the people from the Tate would come by the next day and that's what happened. We're used to working with the museum without any hitches. I see. Do you remember what the boy looked like? Of course. I remember very clearly. Chapter 22. Average. Detective Smith and Peter are asking the owner of the warehouse, Mr. Bennett, some questions about where the mysterious painting was found before being taken to the Tate Museum. Could you describe the young man in as much detail as possible? Of course, I remember well. He had on a red cap with a black visor, and it looked brand new. He wore dark glasses with a black frame. He wore a gray sweatshirt and jeans. Mr. Bennett, do you remember anything else other than his clothes? The color of his hair or eyes? His age? Oh, I see. Well, he was a normal boy. I didn't see his hair as it was under his cap, nor his eyes, as he was wearing glasses. Regarding his age, I would say, between 20 and 35 years old? I'm not sure. Could you tell us how tall he was? He was. Average. Not too tall, not too short. Average. Chapter 23. Fresh Paint. Mr. Bennett gives Laura and Peter the key to the warehouse where the painting had been kept prior to being transported to the museum. The small room is a cube about three meters squared with a metal door, and it's completely empty. Great. Now all we have to do is find every man in London with an average look, between 20 and 35 years old, called Thomas Brown. I'm pretty sure that Thomas Brown isn't the real name of the person who brought the painting to the warehouse. I'm joking, Smith. Of course, it's a fake name. And even if it were his real name, it wouldn't help us. Well, it looks like this storage room is empty. It isn't empty. Look. What is it? Blood? No, it's red paint, like the writing in the picture. Do you know what this means? Does it mean I can't tell the difference between blood and paint? No, it means that this paint was fresh when they brought the painting here. Chapter 24 Adam calls. Detective Smith is back in her office. 
She is in her chair, looking at the picture which is leaning against the wall. Suddenly, the phone rings. Hello? Good day Detective Smith. My name is Adam. Do we know each other? We haven't met yet, but I have a feeling we'll know each other soon. We have friends in common. Who? Natalie and Alice. Oh, they've never mentioned you. The truth is Laura, that Natalie and Alice are part of the same secret society as I am. We know that we can trust you, so that's why I'm telling you. What kind of secret society? We are a network of investigators, historians, and archaeologists who, on a global scale, work to protect the art world by fighting against smuggling, robberies, forgeries. We were certainly impressed with your work exposing Jeremy Bates. Thank you. Could you tell me why you are calling? I'm calling about the painting you have in front of you right now. Chapter 25. What Adam Knows. Detective Smith is speaking on the telephone with Adam, a mysterious friend of Natalie and Alice, who says they are part of a secret society. How do you know about the painting? Natalie told me everything. Don't worry, I'm contacting you to offer my help. Does this secret society have something to do with the picture? No. That's what worries me. Normally, we find out about mysterious cases related to the art world way before the police. But on this occasion, it seems as if this picture has come out of nowhere. Natalie sent me a photo, and we couldn't identify the artist. It's someone who has great technique, but not anyone well known. No offense, Adam, but you aren't helping me much. Ha ha ha, that's true. However, there is something we managed to find out. What did you manage to find out? The people and the places that are in the painting are real. And I think that the person who painted it is trying to warn us of something. Chapter 26. Five Scenes. After finishing her call with Adam, Detective Smith calls Peter to her office. While she is waiting for him, she stops to look closely at the hundreds of details and characters that are displayed all over the painting. What's happening? Any news? Peter, how many years did you work patrolling the streets of London? Almost five years, but I really prefer working in the office. Okay, have a coffee and refresh your memory. Right now, we could really use those five years of experience. What do you mean? Do you see the painting? Do you see that there are five different scenes taking place in five different places? Yes, sure, and there are lots of people in each scene. However, if you look at the details, you can see what's happening. Look at this, do you see what this person has in his hand? A weapon? Exactly. Peter. Tell me if I'm wrong but I think this picture is showing us five crimes. In five places in London. Chapter 27. Analyzing the painting. Laura, along with Peter, analyzes the painting in her office. She uses a magnifying glass to see better. What are we looking for exactly? We need to find details that indicate the place, date, and time. If I'm not wrong. This painting represents five crimes that could happen in any place in London. Okay, okay. Here is something I recognize. I would recognize this sculpture anywhere, with the horse and the bloke on top. Also, the floor below has a very peculiar color. It can only be one place. Where is it? It's Trafalgar Square in London or I'll eat my arm. Chapter 28. Trafalgar Square. Peter has just identified where one of the scenes in the picture is set. It's at Trafalgar Square in London. Now, Peter and Detective Smith need to find out whether there is a crime shown in the picture. Okay, excellent work. Do you see anything suspicious in the scene? There are too many people. 
In any case, the square is often busy because it's popular with tourists. Let me see. It's not suspicious, but there is a newspaper in a pocket, and I think it says the 12th of September. The date of my birthday. That's today. We should be able to see the time on the clock tower. Give me the magnifying glass. Do you see anything? Yes, it's very small but clear. The clock tower says 2.30 in the afternoon. Okay, now all we have to do is find a crime. Chapter 29. Where will the three men in ski masks come in? Laura and Peter have identified the place, date, and time of one of the scenes shown in the mysterious picture that showed up at the Tate Museum. They think that someone could be warning them about a crime that will happen in the city. Almost everyone is dressed as though it's warm. Don't you agree? Yes, it seems that way. Why? Well, because I don't see any weapons, but these three blokes have ski masks. Suspicious, no? Very suspicious. It looks like they are in this shop. What is it? It looks like there are books in the shop. No, but who would rob a bookshop? It's not a bookshop. I know what it is. Chapter 30. Convincing Turner. Detective Smith and Peter run to speak with Inspector Turner to tell him what they have discovered. They find him in his office, having lunch. Inspector. We need to talk to you urgently. What's happened? We think there will be a robbery today at 2.30 in Trafalgar Square. A robbery? Who will be robbed? We think they will try to steal from Knight & Sons, the most important collector's shop in the city. Collector? Stamps, old coins, etc. And how do you know this? Do you have an informant? No, it's on the picked. Of course we have an informant. An anonymous one. Who is it? We don't know. We still don't know. He called us. Please inspector, we have to send a patrol car. It's in less than an hour. It doesn't sound very reliable. Please, sir, it's my birthday. Chapter 31. Trafalgar Square. At the pleas of Detective Smith, Inspector Turner gives his permission to head to Trafalgar Square with reinforcements. Laura, along with Peter, drives there at top speed. Four police cars from the reinforcement unit are waiting for them in the square. There are so many people in the square today. Look, this is Knight and Sons. It's a lovely old shop, don't you think? Yes, it looks as though it has items of value inside. Can you see the reinforcements anywhere? Yes, I think they're over there. Detective Smith? I'm Sergeant Brown. This is my team. They told me at the station that there could be a robbery in the square. Exactly, Sergeant. More precisely, it'll be at the Antiquities Shop Knight and Sons at 2.30 this afternoon. Perfect. What's the plan? As you're all in uniform, I think it'll be better if you all stay nearby ready to come into action when I call. Detective Thompson and I will watch from near the entrance. Understood. All clear, team? Yes, sir. Chapter 32. The Attempted Robbery. Laura and Peter lose themselves in the crowd at the square. Close to the door of the antique, stamp, and coin shop, Knight and Sons. They pretend to be tourists, taking photos and admiring the historical fronts of the buildings in the square. Suddenly, when it gets close to the time, Peter approaches Detective Smith and whispers in her ear while pretending to take a selfie. I think I see them. Can you see those three guys? They're very covered up and I think I can see a ski mask in one of their pockets. Are you talking about the one wearing a red bracelet? Exactly. They are looking in the window of Knight and Sons. Warn Sergeant Brown. Sergeant, can you hear me? I hear you. We think we've identified them. Get ready for action. Look, they're putting on their ski masks and are about to go in. 
Hands in the Air. Chapter 33. Two Arrests. When the three thieves put on their ski masks and take out their weapons to rob Knight and Sons, Detective Smith takes out her weapon and arrests them. Immediately, the officers from the reinforcement unit approach them and get the three criminals to the ground. But, but how can that be? They shouldn't be here. Be quiet. Keep your mouth shut. Don't you see? They have given us away. They shouldn't be here. Shut your mouth. So, you were just taking a stroll in the square with ski masks and three semi-automatic weapons? We won't speak without a lawyer. Fine, no problem. Sergeant Brown, take them to the police station. Of course, detective. Chapter 34. Mr. Knight. After hearing the chaos at the door, the owner of the shop, Mr. Knight goes out to see what is happening and thank Detective Smith in person. Were these men going to come in and rob my shop? Yes, sir. Fortunately, we stopped them in time. Was there anything valuable? Of course. Many things, but it can't be a coincidence that they came in today to rob me. What do you mean by that, Mr. Knight? Today, we received one of the most valuable items we've had in the history of our shop. The British Guiana One Cent Magenta Stamp. What's that? What is it? It's one of three of the most valuable stamps in the world. One of a kind. The stamp collector who owned it died and his sons put it up for sale. It's going to be auctioned in our shop in one week. Just as a matter of interest Mr. Knight, how much is that stamp worth? Well, it'll start in the auction at five. Five thousand pounds for a stamp? Ha 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 ha, lady, you are very funny. Of course not. Five million. Chapter 35 the return to the station. After reassuring Mr. Knight that there will be a policeman outside to guard his shop until the auction, Laura and Peter go back to the police station. They talk about the case on the way. It seems like the painting was right. It's incredible. Do you think it will help prevent more crimes? Yes, I think so. But, there is a bigger mystery than that. Who painted it? Not exactly. I'm not really interested in who painted the picture, but in how they knew that the crimes would happen. Do you think that it could be a reformed criminal? A criminal who discovered his love of painting? Something like that is possible. It's definitely someone who has access to information. Nevertheless, it's someone choosing to give us the information. Otherwise, he wouldn't have hung it in a museum. And that's the biggest mystery of all. Why would they paint it? Chapter 36. The Interrogation Room. Detective Inspector Turner is questioning the robbers in the interrogation room at the police station. Officer Wilson is standing next to the door. Detective Smith and Peter approach in order to participate in the interrogation. Good day Officer Wilson. May we come in? Detective Inspector Turner has ordered that nobody be allowed to enter at the moment. That's odd. Oh, he's coming out now. Well guys, I couldn't get much out of them. We would like to ask the robbers some questions. I've already interrogated them, Smith, and they aren't talking. We don't even know their names. With all due respect boss, I would like to ask them some questions. Hmm. Okay, Smith, but this is your last birthday favor. Understood, boss. This'll only take five minutes, I promise. Chapter 37. The Interrogation. The thieves are sitting next to each other in the interrogation room. Peter goes in behind Detective Smith and closes the door. Shouldn't there be a mirror in this room to watch and listen to us from the other side? Be quiet. Why does everybody always ask the same question? It's not a Hollywood film. No one is listening to what we say. It's a normal room. 
Okay. Are you going to question us again? Listen, we have some questions here. Although, in reality, I don't really want to ask you this without letting you know something else. I suspect there is an informant, a whistleblower inside your group of friends. I knew it. Be quiet for once. We mustn't say a word. Didn't you get that? Who is the whistleblower? I'm not sure, but it could be anyone who likes to paint. Painting? Like someone who paints houses? No. Painting pictures. Art. Does that sound familiar to you? Chapter 38. Help. After leaving the interrogation room, Laura and Peter go back to Laura's office, where the painting is. Right. Well, mentioning the painting didn't cause a reaction in them at all. I doubt they have ever set foot in a museum in their lives. It looks like the picture wasn't done by someone in their group. We are very far from discovering the truth about the person who painted it. Anyway, we can worry about that after we are sure we have prevented all of the crimes that are shown in it. Okay, let's go back to the magnifying glass then. Yes, but it would be better if we had help. Are you finally going to tell Detective Inspector Turner about the painting? No, I think it's best if we leave him out of it, as he's being a bit odd today. I'm going to call Natalie, since she knows more about art than we do. Chapter 39. Turner knocks on the door. Laura and Peter, with Natalie's help, are trying to identify the places and times of the four other crimes shown in the mysterious painting. Natalie writes it all down in a notebook while they discover clues in different elements of the picture. Okay, so we have a strange parcel that will arrive at King's Cross train station at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. A robbery at a jewelry shop in the London borough of Chelsea at 5.30. And a drug deal in Brixton at 7 o'clock in the evening. And in terms of the fifth scene, I can't work out what is happening. These people here look worried, but they don't look like criminals. There is a house here with an open window, but you can't see anything inside. Knock, knock, good afternoon. Boss, how can we help you? I have a question. Wait, what are you doing? We are trying to figure out. We think there might have been a forgery. That's why Natalie is helping us analyze the picture. Okay, I wanted to know something. Did you manage to find out anything about the informant who warned you about the robbery at the stamp shop? No, yes. He called from a public telephone, so it was impossible to find out more. Okay, let me know if he calls back or you find out something else. Understood, boss. Chapter 40. The Fifth Crime. When Turner leaves Detective Smith's office, Laura, Peter, and Natalie carry on trying to figure out the fifth crime that is shown in the picture. Well, we have an open window and a group of very worried people. One of them is crying. What is this car doing here? We can see the time on the dashboard. It says 2030. There is a person inside. How do you know there is only one person? Can't you see? There is only a driver in the car. There could be someone else, in the boot. Peter, you are right. Look, there is a teddy bear sticking out of the boot. That means... That it's a kidnapping. The open window of the house belongs to the child's bedroom, and the worried people are the neighbors and family, who have just found out she is missing. Drat, I have to make an urgent phone call. To whom? To Sarah, Jake's nanny. I won't be getting home until late today. Chapter 41. The Strategy. Laura, Peter, and Natalie need to plan how to prevent the crimes in the picture. Okay, we need to speak to Turner. Do you agree? That way, we can get patrols set up at every location. You're actually going to think I'm crazy, but I don't think we should tell Turner about any of this. 
he's acting really strange. Also, the fewer people that know about the matter, the more likely the criminals won't find out about any of it. I don't think you're crazy. I actually agree with you. Okay, let's deal with it ourselves, the two of us. I can also help. Natalie, it could be dangerous. It was also dangerous when we put a stop to the thief of the William Turner paintings. That man had a weapon. Do you remember? Precisely. Are you sure you want to put yourself in danger? I will be fine. You will only have me close by in case you need help. Okay. The next two crimes are happening very soon. And they will both happen at similar times. So we need to split up. Natalie and I will go to the King's Cross train station to see if we can find the suspicious parcel that is due to arrive at 4 o'clock, while Peter will go to the jewelry shop for the robbery at 5 o'clock. Peter, try to get help from a local copper. And be careful. You too. Chapter 42. King's Cross. Laura and Natalie monitor the arrivals board at the immense and packed King's Cross train station waiting for the platform to be announced for the Cambridge train's arrival at 4.30. There it is, on the board. It says it will arrive on platform 11. It's the other side of the station. We need to run. Let's go. I'm going to speak to security so that they can search the luggage. We have to be quick. The train arrives in five minutes. Look, there is a security officer right there. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Detective Smith from the Central Police Station. Good afternoon, Detective. How can I help you? We have reason to believe that a package with illegal substances is on board this train arriving from Cambridge. Could we urgently put a search on the luggage? Of course. We don't normally take security measures on this train, but given the circumstances, I can get the whole team on it. Thanks a lot. 43. Luggage Search The security team at King's Cross train station perform a luggage search. When the train arrives from Cambridge, all of the passengers need to form a long queue and, one by one, show the contents of their luggage. They don't find anything strange until a woman with a red scarf over her head opens her bag. We have something here. It's a parcel with white powder in it. Let's have a look. What is this parcel? Madam, what is this? It's nothing, just sugar. Sugar? This isn't sugar, but it isn't drugs either. It has a label, but it's written in Chinese. Officer, does anyone in your team speak Chinese? No, but one of the shopkeepers in the train station is Chinese, my friend Alan. I'll go and get him immediately. Chapter 44. The Strange Substance The officer comes back a few moments later with Alan, his Chinese friend who works in one of the shops at King's Cross train station. The woman in the red scarf looks very nervous. Alan greets both Detective Smith and Natalie and reads the label of the suspicious package. He looks horrified when he reads it. I can't believe it. That's horrible. What does the label say? It says, Black Rhinoceros Horn. What? The species of rhino that became extinct a few months ago because they were being killed for their horns? Exactly. This is terrible. It must be worth a fortune. But the worst thing is that a rare animal died. Many practitioners of Chinese medicine think that it has healing properties. I think it's awful that they kill animals for this. I don't know anything. My friend gave it to me. And told me it was sugar. I was supposed to take it to a friend of hers here in London. Keep your story for our questioning. This is an illegal substance, and it is very probable that you will go to prison. Thank you for your help, Alan. No problem, detective. Chapter 45. The Robbery at the Jewelry Shop Laura and Natalie leave King's Cross to take the woman in the red scarf to the police station. 
On the way, they call Peter to find out more from him about the robbery at the police station. Peter. How's it going? Good. We recently handed over the thieves to the police squad to take to the station. However. What? What's happened? Well it took me a while to get the police squad to help me. In the beginning, they told me the jewelry shop wasn't on their beat today. Until I told them that it would be their fault if the jewelry shop got robbed. Then they started to be more helpful. Okay, that's strange. Do you know what? It'll be better not to take them to the central police station. Better to take them to the local police station. Is that okay? Understood. And then go straight to Brixton. We have to stop this drug deal. 